Jen did at noon, so um, she'll uphold the uh, true tradition of the starlight, right? <laughs> um, uh, Anne um, graduated in 2001 again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 2010 from the um, University of the Virgin Islands with a BS in marine biology. Uh, she did something probably few of you have done. Uh, she spent a, mes a semester abroad and sailed from Tahiti to Australia, uh, 4,500 nautical miles. I'm really jealous of that. Um, so that must have been a great trip. And she attended the College of Charleston for a year. Um, and then um, after graduating, um, well, um, you know, she um, was a research assistant uh, conducting um, uh, visual censuses for um, uh, Rick Namath, a, a professor at the University of Virgin Islands. And she had spent, as you know, she's been a water baby. She's uh, spent most of her time in the water um, and around the water during her life. And um, she uh, wrote me in her uh, letter and said, uh, when she came here, and uh, she said she had witnessed a decline in the marine environment around the Virgin Islands and wants to work towards conservation uh, of marine systems and biodiversity. Um, I, um, I th was really uh, pleased with that statement, and then I've learned to r realize that she was partly to blame for that decline. <laughs> And you know, those of you who know her know that she has a, a strong um, hunter-gatherer ethic. <laughs> and um, she, um, she uh, clearly either got run out of Dodge um, or wanted to come north uh, to uh, try out <laughs> new things and learn new approaches. And uh, she was cold for the first year she was here. Still cold. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but uh, she learned to um, adapt to local customs and use the local clothing um, for the Arctic uh, around here. Uh, uh, very quickly we saw uh, Anne as capability and um, I'll have to say that in one of her letters of recommendation um, I learned that uh, um, the, re the person said that she was 100 pounds dripping wet but uh, out carried and outworked everybody else on in their group, and uh, we certainly saw that in uh, CCFRP. And she got started with that, and um, you know wouldn't stop fishing and carrying fish. And um, then we had to get her off the fishing part and uh, get her into tagging fish, so she could have her thrill and uh, poking things. Um, but uh, she. Uh, has been great at sea, and uh, she uh, was very involved in early years, her early years here in uh, CCFRP. Um, and then she got interested in the video lander project that uh, came along about the same time that uh, she was looking for a thesis. And um, you know, she got um, involved working with Donna Klein here uh, with her rotating video lander. Um, and, of course, catching fish whenever she could. Um, but uh, she was interested in, uh, expect, interested in learning a new technique. She had some of her uh, scuba skills down. She had uh, the acoustic uh, tagging and tr uh, tracking uh, experience, and um, she was interested in the, the video analyses. Um, still having a little bit of a hard time getting warm. <laughs> <laughs> so, she, uh, when her downtime's working at sea, she would try to find some place in the cabin that was warm, or if we were busy working in the cabin, she would uh, go out on the back deck and, and huddle back there. Um, also, um, on balmy fall days, she would be in her uh, Eskimo outfit. Uh, the rest of us would be in bathing suits on the back deck, and she'd be um, 
all geared up. She learned to adapt, though, and as most of you know, who know Anne know, that she um, she's, doesn't have an ounce of fat on her, and uh, the only way she can keep warm is to constantly eat. Um, and one of the things we learned is that uh, she doesn't eat vegetables. <laughs> um, in fact, she mostly eats uh, sweets and junk food. Um, but <laughs> that's how she keeps warm. Uh, I think there's just something about living on a, a little deserted island, nearly deserted <laughs> island, <laughs> in, the, in the Caribbean. <laughs> Where, uh, so um, she uh, adapted uh, well to living up here. And uh, the other thing that we learned is that um, uh, Anne has uh, interest in all marine creatures. She was out feeding the albatross. I wish I don't have slides that hopefully you do of her out on the back deck taking the um, bait that we were using and giving it to the albatross uh, because she thought the albatross needed it too. So we were out uh, whale watching one time, and I realized just her fondness for nature. And then I realized that her hunter-gatherer um, <laughs> psyche really is hard to repress. <laughs> and we had to steer her away from the, the whales. Um, but um, despite all of those uh, kind of outstanding or excellence in the field projects, um, she also has done a really super job in the intellectual components of her, her job. Uh, she uh, won the uh, Best Poster Award at the Western Groundfish Conference in, um, in Newport a couple years ago. And uh, these are the winners of the variety of different um, uh, best uh, uh, oral presentation, best poster. Um, and, um, and then uh, she uh, learned afterwards that it was good to be silly as well. Um, but um, she, um, she celebrated pretty well that night. I, no, that was the day you traveled, so you couldn't celebrate. Well, maybe you didn't. This? No. That's, that's, a, that's a Halloween. <laughs> that's, a, that's a Halloween party. <laughs> I don't want to spread any lies about and OK. Um, then, um, in the spring of 2014, actually it was the winter, uh, she came up to me and said, um, I need to take a semester off because uh, this has kind of been too easy for me. Um, <laughs> yeah, graduate school is pretty easy here at Moss Landing. So I think I'm going <laughs> to have a child and then, uh, and then uh, be a super mom and uh, get a degree as well. So uh, she, here's a picture of her with uh, Christian. And you'll see that uh, he's already, uh, she's already teaching him how to uh, appropriately euthanize a king mackerel here. Uh, but, uh, she's, he's got a big uh, wrapper. Problem is that she wanted to release this fish unharmed. <laughs> and so um, I don't have a, the after picture, but uh, you'll have to tell us whether he. No, he won, we kept it. <laughs> So uh, she became a super mom and uh, uh, started working from the uh, Virgin Islands. But just being a mom and going to school was a little too difficult for her. So she got a full-time job as well, working for a consulting firm. And it's a sleepy little consulting firm in a little you know, deserted island in the Caribbean. Um, <laughs> until Hurricane Wilma and Irma came by. And then suddenly uh, she was working 80 or 90 or 100 hour weeks uh, on the consulting firm and trying to get water to the Virgin Islands um, and electricity and cleaning up debris and uh, transporting or transplanting corals in her job. Um, so for the last couple of years, um, she's been raising a child um, living on a deserted island. Um, working full-time, wandering through debris. Um, I don't know which part of this boat you're living in, but... Uh, <laughs> um, and working on her thesis. And so um, 
finally she, she decided she has had enough of the cold weather and she's come up here to uh, show us what she's done and it's, it's a great um, body of work she's done. Some introduction. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. You've been on point today with those introductions. <laughs> uh, all right. I'll get this up first for y'all to see my screen. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you guys for coming. Get this. Back. Okay. Today I'll be presenting my thesis on predicting spatial distributions of demersal fishes off central California. So originally seafloor mapping was done primarily for navigational purposes. But today, seafloor mapping has many biological applications. Seafloor maps are used in marine zoning, where areas are sometimes allocated for different uses based on benthic habitat. Seafloor maps can also be used to delineate essential fish habitat, or EFH. Maps like this one here are being used to classify different benthic habitats, and these benthic maps can be used to help define EFH based on known species habitat preferences. Seafloor maps are also used in habitat conservation, or benthic maps can be used to protect a habitat based on its features or if it's essential fish habitat. For example, the cow cod conservation areas were implemented in 2001 based on depths where cow cod occur. Bottom fishing is restricted below 20 fathoms or 36 meters where adult habitat is common. And seafloor maps can also be used in species distribution modeling, which is what I'll be talking about today. This is where fish observations are paired with benthic maps to create models predicting habitat suitability or density or biomass. So the seafloor is mapped using remote sensing techniques, uh, particularly acoustic transmission. So multi-beam sonar is a type of sound tr transmitting and receiving system which is used to measure seafloor depth. Multi-beam echo sounders work by transmitting a sound pulse towards the seafloor and measuring the time it takes for the sound pulse to bounce off the seafloor and return to the receiver. The longer it takes for the pulse to return to the receiver, the deeper the seafloor is. So once data is collected, the raw sounding data have to be adjusted and reprocessed to produce final soundings. And then the result of the data collection and processing is a bathymetric map or digital elevation model or DEM. So this map here is showing bottom depth in Monterey Bay and specifically the Monterey Canyon. And it is, um, it was mapped by Ambari. So in 2007, the California Ocean Potential Protection Council authorized funding to establish the California Seafloor Mapping Program, or the CSMP. The CSMP is a cooperative program to create a geologic and habitat-based map series for all of California state waters. Experts from state and federal agencies, academia, and private industry were all assembled to develop the best approach to mapping and classifying California habitats. Initiated in 2008, the CSMP began mapping seafloor habitat in California state waters and creating detailed bathymetric maps. So if you look at the detailed benthic map here at Mavericks, we can see the unique bottom variation which helps form the large waves that occur here. So because of the fine detail of these maps, one of the uses has been in species distribution modeling. So species distribution models can be used to estimate habitat suitability or likeliness of occurrence of fish or other marine organisms. The map on the left here is predicting probability of occurrence of Boccaccio rockfish, and the one on the right is predicting Boccaccio rockfish catch per unit effort. Species distribution modeling can also be used to target fish, either for research or consumption. So it can be used to improve survey design for studies looking to observe or collect specific species, or it can be used by fishermen to target habitats of healthy stocks and avoid likely habitats of overfish stocks. SDM can also be used to predict fish distributions outside of a sampled area. 
So if you have observations over a small area, but bathymetry that covers a larger area, you can create maps of habitat suitability for a larger area than was surveyed. Uh, SDM can also be used to identify areas for habitat or species protection, where habitat is protected based on its suitability for a specific species. Um, and <clears throat> SDM can also be used to obtain species density and biomass estimates, which can be used to inform stock assessments. So in California, several studies have used species distribution modeling to predict spatial distributions of species, or of fish species. So Young et al. 2010 developed models and maps of predicted occurrence for rosy rockfish and yellowtail rockfish on Cordell Bank. These models were created using presence, observation, presence, absence, fish observation data paired with bathymetric maps, and they predict the likelihood of occurrence of each species. Heather Bolton's thesis in 2014 assessed size-specific habitat preferences of canary rockfish using size as a proxy for age and created maps of predicted occurrence. So many of the predictive modeling studies have used presence-absence data and predicted likelihood of occurrence. However, a study by Wedding and Yakovich in 2015 used fish count data to create models predicting species density and biomass for rosy and starry rockfish. So with 30 years of fish observation data collected by submersibles, ROVs, and drop cameras, and the availability of high quality benthic maps along the California coastline, species distribution modeling is being used more frequently to predict where we should find fish and how many fish we should find. So the use of species distribution modeling has also helped people look at benthic habitat in different ways. So small scale benthic habitat has often been classified by features that we see and habitat data is collected using visual observations. So descriptors such as depth, bottom type, relief, rugosity, the ones you're seeing on the left, um, are used to describe benthic habitat and often species relationships are also described in these terms. So for example, many fish are known to, for their affinity towards rock and others are characterized for only living in sand. However, there are many other ways to describe benthic habitat. Remote sensing allows us to to describe benthic habitat in terms of geomorphology. So through remote sensing, we can describe the morphology or the shape of the seafloor in several ways. Um, slope or rate of change of seafloor depth is often used to describe seafloor variation. Curvature refers to the slope of the slope or the rate of change of slope. Um, benthic position index or BPI is a measure of relative seafloor elevation and can be calculated at different scales. And then vector ruggedness measure, or VRM, is a measure of, it's similar to rugosity, and it's a measure of structural complexity. So, and you can also calculate, calculate Euclidean straight line distances to different features. So we know that remotely sensed variables are being used to describe species habitat relationships, and that species distribution modeling is being used more frequently to predict not only occurrences, but also densities and biomass. So because of this, it's important to understand the factors that drive and affect these models. So I wanted to take a look at individual species habitat associations and assess the use of different habitat variables as model predictors. Do predictive models using observed or remotely sensed data perform better? I also want to test the models in real life. Will a model created with data from one year be able to predict fish densities the following year? Temporal variation in other variables, such as oceanographic characteristics, which were not included in the model, may affect observed species densities. And then additionally, I thought it was important to look at the effect of map resolution on biomass predictions. So map resolution refers to the cell size of a map, which determines the detail. Um, bathymetric maps are like photos, which are made up of a grid of pixels or cells. So the pixel size of a photo determines the sharpness of an image, as does the cell size in a bathymetric map. So high resolution photos <coughs> and maps, like on the left, are made up of a large number of small pixels and show a clear image, while low resolution photos and maps are made up of a smaller number of larger pixels and show a blurrier image. <coughs> I wanted to evaluate the potential differences in biomass estimates among maps of different resolution because it's important to understand the factors that can affect these predicted estimates. So with, there are two overarching goals in this study. First one is to understand relationships between demersal fish species and benthic habitat. And the second one is to use spatial modeling to predict distributions along the central California coast. So within these broad goals, there are several objectives. 
So within the first goal, we have objective one, identify species relationships with observed habitat features. Objective two, identify species relationships with remotely sensed habitat features. And objective three, develop predictive models of species density and compare model performance between models using remotely sensed variables and models using observed habitat variables. <clears throat> so within the second goal, my objectives are to develop predictive maps of species density, to test accuracy and precision of model predictions and estimates, and to develop predictive models and maps of species biomass and evaluate differences in biomass estimates over different map resolutions. On to the methods. So the study was originally done on six demersal fish species. However, the overarching trends were the same across all six species, so today I'm going to be talking about three. So the first of which is copper rockfish. Copper rockfish range from the Gulf of Alaska down to Baja, California, Mexico. It can be found in shallow kelp bed habitat with rocky bottom, but is, have also been found to occur as deep as 183 meters. But in California, they are most commonly found shallower than 90 meters and almost exclusively in rocky habitat. Green spotted rockfish have been found to range from Washington down to Baja, California, Mexico. Green spotted rockfish are often found in mixed bottom habitats or habitats where more than one bottom type is occurring. And particularly, they're found in areas where mud and rock or mud and cobble are co-occurring. Green spotted rockfish commonly occur at depths between 50 and 200 meters. Vermilion rockfish range from Prince William Sound, Alaska down to Baja, California, but are most commonly found from Northern California southward. Vermilion can be found in shallow waters, but also have been seen to occur over 400 meters deep. Vermilion are, the, are most commonly encountered, though, between 50 and 150 meters and are most often seen in complex, high-relief rocky habitat. All right, so this study was done along the central coast of California. 700 video surveys were completed from 2013 to 2014 in 70 to 250 meters of depth. The study site was partitioned into three zones based on gaps in available bathymetry. And these zones are north, central, and south. So the north zone is offshore of San Francisco. Let's see if I can get this thing working. There's a north zone. The central zone it encompasses Monterey Bay and extends down to the Sur Canyon. And the south zone ranges from um, Lopez Point to Cape San Martin. So oh, um, Portuguese Ledge is the site I chose to test the effect of map resolution on biomass estimates. Portuguese Ledge is an area of rock outcroppings located in the southern half of Monterey Bay. I chose to create predictive maps around the hard bottom habitat where there was both 1 meter, 5 meter, and 10 meter resolution bathymetry available. So we used the video lander to collect fish count data as well as observed habitat data. The video lander is a stationary drop camera system consisting of two paired calibrated stereo video cameras mounted on a rotating base. The cameras are here and this is the base. <coughs> The motor allows for a 360 degree camera rotation, allowing us a full 360 degree view of habitat and fish. Each full rotation lasted about a minute and surveys were limited to 12 rotations or about 12 minutes. Survey time was chosen after assessing species accumulation curves and determining when the drop off of the rate of influx of new individuals occurred. The lander was also baited with two jars of cut up frozen squid with the idea of reattracting fish from the immediate area, which might have been initially disturbed by the arrival of the lander. Um, and there was also a 300 meter umbilical which allowed for live video feed on board. We could assess whether the lander was tipped over or if there was any issues with cameras or lights or rotation to ensure the quality of our video surveys. Video files were imported into CGIS event measure software. Because of camera calibration prior to video surveys, the stereo cameras can calculate 3D position of any point relative to the camera. Because of this, several different metrics could be calculated. Distance of detection information is available for every fish observation, and we decided to include fish identified within the range of 95% of species observations in the fish counts. The outer 5% of fish were not included in an effort to avoid counting fish where identification was more difficult due to the fish being further away. Um, fish lengths could also be calculated with the precise, precise measurement tools within event measure, measurement accuracy and using stereo cameras and CGIS event measure is very high. 
Denny, 2017, found that over 95% of fish measurements had a predicted error of less than 5%. Um, area sampled could also be calculated for each species based on distance of detection and the outer radius set at 95% of observations. And because we had fish count and an area surveyed, we were able to calculate species density at each survey location. And additionally, I used fish lengths paired with published species weight length relationships to calculate biomass at each survey location. So once we obtained our fish counts and calculated density and biomass, this data was imported into ArcGIS. The georeference point count data was overlaid onto benthic maps or the remotely sensed habitat layers. The value of each remotely sensed variable at each survey point was extracted and applied to the species point file so that there's a depth, slope, curvature, value, etc., associated with each fish. So through the use of the Marine Geospatial Ecology Toolbox, spatial models can be created of species density and biomass on these relationships with remotely sensed habitat. MGET is an open source geoprocessing toolbox in ArcGIS developed by Duke University. The statistical software package R is integrated within MGET, which allows it to be used in multivariate species modeling. Um, MGET is implemented on the ArcGIS platform to display species distribution models in the form of habitat suitability maps. And MGET has been used in modeling leatherback turtle movements, bluefin tuna larval distributions, and albatross bycatch, as well as used in predictive modeling studies to evaluate rockfish species distributions in Central California. All right, so I'm going to talk about the data analyses that I did. So the Kruskal-Wallace test was used to analyze the relationship between species density and bottom type, relief and rugosity. So a Kruskal-Wallace test is a non-parametric test that can be used in lieu of an ANOVA when the data do not fall within the assumption of normal distribution. The Kruskal-Wallace test can be used when determining differences in means of count and density data because these data are often skewed and zero inflated. The wilcoxon man whitney test was used as a post hoc test to determine where the differences occurred among groups. Linear regressions were used to identify individual species associations with each remotely sensed habitat characteristic. <clears throat> and then a principal component analysis was run using log transformed remotely sensed variables and then linear regressions were used with the resulting principal components as habitat variables. Additionally, to evaluate each set of variables as a group, two sets of Poisson generalized linear models or GLMs were run for each species one using observed habitat variables and the other using remotely sensed habitat variables. Poisson GLMs assume the response variable has a Poisson distribution and are often used with count data, which are zero inflated. The stepwise backward function was used to determine which habitat variables are most important, starting with all the variables and taking them out one by one. <clears throat> using model output summaries, I could assess which models explain more deviance in species densities and which models had better model fit and lower error rates. In this way, we can evaluate the strength of each predictor group. All right, so to create the maps of predicted density, a tool within MGET was used to create a habitat suitability layer indicating predicted density. And this habitat layer is based on the combined strength of relationships between the density of fish and each predictor variable. This tool outputs a continuous prediction map with a predicted density value for each pixel or cell of the map. To conduct practical model testing, I created a model with species observations from one year and compared observed species densities from the following year. I plotted observed versus predicted density values to determine if the model accurately predicts what we are observing. And then to test the effect of map resolution on species habitat associations, I ran a biomass model for each species and created predictive maps of species biomass at Portuguese Ledge using 1 meter, 5 meter, and 10 meter resolution bathymetry maps. I also compared total biomass at Portuguese Ledge and total biomass over hard bottom at Portuguese Ledge. <clears throat> and I created predictive maps of species biomass over the whole study area, and total biomass was calculated for the larger north, central, and south zones as well. All right, so on to my results. <clears throat> Visual surveys occurred over several months in 2013 and 2014. The video lander was deployed 700 times from the fishing vessel Donna Kathleen over a total of 91 days. In total, 2,600 fish were identified from the visual surveys. 
<clears throat> Vermilion rockfish were the most abundant of the three study species of observed in the visual surveys, followed by green spotted rockfish. And copper rockfish were the least abundant species observed. Sampling effort was spread somewhat evenly over the categories of bottom type and relief. And rugosity was the most unevenly sampled observed habitat characteristics, with only 10% of surveys occurring in high rugosity habitat. Um, high rugosity habitat might have been sampled less just because this habitat is less common. So using Kruskal Wallace test, the significant differences in densities were seen for all species over all observed habitat variables. Mean species density is shown in bar graphs and significant differences are shown above the bars, the letters. And then I have a fish here so you can see which graph is for each species. So copper rockfish mean densities. <clears throat> was highest over hard bottoms, areas of medium relief, and high rugosity habitats. They followed a linear trend with bottom type and rugosity where, where densities increased with increasing bottom hardness and increasing rugosity. Significant differences in green spotted rockfish densities were found with bottom type relief and rugosity as well, where mean density was similar over both hard and mixed bottoms and highest in areas of medium relief and medium rugosity. Vermilion rockfish mean densities followed a linear trend with respect to all observed habitat variables, where densities were highest in hard, hard bottom, high relief, high rugosity habitats, and lowest in soft bottom, low relief, low rugosity habitats. So overall, we're seeing strong individual relationships between each species and each observed habitat variable. So the results of the linear regressions of density variability with remotely sensed habitat variables show that shoot Few variables were significant for each species. In the summary table at the top, output statistics are shown only where significant relationships were seen, indicated by p-values lower than 0.05. Of the remotely sensed habitat variables, copper rockfish density showed significant variation only with VRM, where densities increased with increasing VRM, or vector recognition measure, if you guys can remember. Green spotted rockfish density on the other hand, showed significant association with three remotely sensed variables, slope, broad scale BPI, and distance to shoreline. So although p-values indicate highly significant relationships with both slope and distance to shoreline, the higher F ratio indicated that the relationship with distance to shoreline might be the strongest for green spotted rockfish. So vermilion rockfish densities were significantly associated with distance to shelf edge and distance to canyon heads. Um, but overall, though, I found weak individual species relationships with each remotely sensed variable and low R-squared values indicating that each variable is explaining only a small amount of variation in densities. So on to the results of the principal component analysis, or PCA. So a table of eigenvalue outputs on the left and a loadings table on the right were used to interpret the PCA. The loading values not only have directional eigenvector information, but also combine magnitude and variance. So I'm going to focus on principal components 1 and 2, or PC1 and 2, which collectively describe about 47% of the variability in remotely sensed variables. So PC1 accounted for 25.2% of the variability. Slope, depth, VRM, and distance to shelf edge are the largest contributors to PC1 and describe more variation than any other combination of any other variables. PC2 accounts for 21.7% of the variability in variables, and another set of variables describe the bulk of the variation in PC2. So significant relationships were seen with PC1 and PC2 among all three study species using linear regressions. Using principal components as habitat variables showed that the grouping of remotely sensed habitat variables had stronger relationships with species densities than individual remotely sensed variables on their own. So moving along to the GLM results. Several metrics were used to assess model fit and performance. Deviance is a measure of how well the model fits the data, so more deviance was explained by remotely sensed models for all species. The remotely sensed models for green spotted and vermilion rockfish especially explained a large amount of deviance. R-squared values are also used as an indicator of variation in densities explained by the models. And R-squared values were highest for all species in models using remotely sensed habitat variables. Normalized root mean square error is a measure of model error where lower values indicate less residual variance. And there was little difference in error rates between the two sets of models. So 
models using remotely sensed habitat variables were used to map spatial density distributions of study species in the central zone of our study area. Only a small number of predictors were included in the model predicting copper rockfish densities. <coughs> Depth is the most significant predictor in the copper rockfish model, indicated by a highly significant p-value. And additionally, depth explains the most deviance of all the habitat predictors, explaining 86.3% of the total deviance explained by predictors. So when we look at the map predicting copper density in Monterey Bay, it's apparent that the relationship with depth is driving the map results. Highest predicted values, shown in red, you can see, are all along the shallow areas of the map, and predicted values decrease as depth increases. So a Geddes Ord hotspot analysis was overlaid on the predictive map, and the hotspot analysis shows peaks in species densities that we actually observe. So these are just the dots that are on top of the predictive map. So the hotspot analysis is used to visually compare predicted and observed densities, and from the hotspot analysis, we can see that observed hotspots sometimes, but don't always coincide with high predicted densities. So all habitat predictors were included in the green spotted rockfish model except VRM. Additionally, the relationship between densities and habitat predictors is highly significant for most of the variables. However, when we look at the deviance explained by each predictor, it's apparent that slope and distance to shoreline are the most influential predictors in the model. When we look at the map, we can see that the map predicts highest densities in low slope areas further from the shoreline. Observed hotspots mostly coincide with high predicted densities. Several habitat predictors were significant in describing vermilion rockfish density distributions. Densities were seen to decrease with increasing depth, slope, distance to shoreline, and distance to shelf edge, and decrease closer to canyon heads. <clears throat> the predictor distance to canyon heads explained half of the deviance explained by the habitat variables. So when we look at the vermilion rockfish predicted density map in Monterey Bay, we can see that higher density predictions almost all fall south of the Monterey Canyon. And in general, predicted densities are low for vermilion in Monterey. And observed hotspots did not really coincide with high predicted densities. So we looked at our model output statistics for models and assessed model performance from those, but I wanted to do more practical model testing. So I split the data from both years and used 2013 observation data to create predictive models. And then I took the values predicted using the 2013 data and compared them to the densities that we actually observed in 2014. So for all species, there is a positive significant linear relationship between observed and predicted densities. Now if observed densities were equal to predicted densities, the point should fall along the line. And if observed densities were higher than predicted densities, the points would fall above the line. But when we look at the, the plots, we can see that the points are all falling below the line, which is showing us that predicted densities are higher than observed densities. So we know the models are over-predicting densities, but by how much? So when looking at the proportion of observed density values to predicted density values, we see that most of the time, observed values were with 10 to within 10 to 20% of predicted values. However, when we look at the right-hand side of the histograms, we can see that there's a small number of surveys where the ratio flips and where observed densities are higher than predicted. Moving along. So Portuguese Ledge is the site I use to compare biomass estimates over maps of different resolution. This image here shows a large rock outcrop commonly referred to as Portuguese Ledge. The lighter colored bumpy looking areas are the area of rock, while the surrounding areas which look flatter and darker are soft sediment. I created models predicting biomass for each species using all study data, <clears throat> and then created predictive maps at Portuguese Ledge using maps of 1 meter, 5 meter, and 10 meter resolutions. All right, so the range of biomass predictions for each cell on the map are shown in the key on the right hand side of each map. These predicted biomass ranges were scaled to kilograms per 100 meters square. Biomass predictions were summed over the area of each map and reported in tons. The area mapped at one meter bathymetry was smaller than at other resolutions, so biomass sums were scaled to the area of one meter map coverage for all resolutions. 
B2 is biomass summed over the whole area pictured on, sorry, so B1 is biomass summed over the smaller area, and B2 is biomass summed over the whole area pictured on the 5 meter and the 10 meter maps. So high predicted values occurred on the shallower, rocky areas at Portuguese Ledge. The highest individual biomass prediction, as well as highest total biomass, occurred using the 1 meter resolution map. The total biomass using the 1 meter resolution map is over 30 times total biomass using either the 5 meter or the 10 meter resolution maps. And lowest total biomass was predicted on the 10 meter map. The green spotted rockfish map showed different results between the 1 meter, 5 meter, and 10 meter maps. High predicted biomass occur on top of the rock area on the 1 meter map, while high predicted biomass occur adjacent to the rocky areas on the 5 meter map. So high predicted biomass values oh, shite, are shown in red. <laughs> sorry, 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 excuse me. Um, high predicted biomass is shown in red and down to low predicted in blue. So you can see on top of the rock here, we're getting the high predicted values. And right next to the rock with the five meter map, we're getting high predicted values. And then when you look at the 10 meter resolution map, there's high predicted values just kind of in the whole sandy area that's surrounding the rock. So Looking at the maps, it looks like there's a larger amount of area of high predicted biomass at the 10 meter resolution. However, total biomass is much higher at the 1 meter resolution if you look at the numbers. Green, fish, green spotted rockfish predicted biomass sum for the mapped area at 1 meter resolution is more than 8,000 times the sum over the same area using the 5 meter resolution map. So in general, we're seeing a trend of total predicted biomass decreasing with resolution. Vermilion highest predicted biomass values occur on and southwest of rocky areas at Portuguese Ledge. So they're following the trend seen with all the other species. Highest predicted biomass occurred using the 1 meter resolution map and lowest predicted biomass using the 10 meter resolution map. All right, so here's a table of the same information shown on the maps. Predicted biomass for each species was summed over the area mapped at 1 meter resolution. Biomass estimates using 1 meter bathymetry are unusually high. And total biomass estimates for all species are highest using 1 meter bathymetry and lowest using 10 meter bathymetry. All right, so I then wanted to look at total biomass predicted over hard bottom habitat and compare it with observed biomass. So here's a map of hard and soft bottom for Portuguese ledge, where the seafoam green color indicates the soft bottom habitat and the darker green color is hard bottom habitat. So I total predicted biomass over areas of hard bottom for each species. And then, I, and then total observed biomass was calculated by multiplying mean observed biomass and over the area of hard bottom habitat. So one thing to note is that despite scaling the 5 meter and the 10 meter rasters down to the size of the 1 meter raster, the area designated as hard bottom was still different among maps of different resolution. Looking at the estimates, we can see that the largest differences between observed biomass and predicted biomass occur on the 1 meter resolution map. Total predicted biomass is much higher than total observed biomass for all species. However, when comparing biomass sums on the 5 meter and the 10 meter resolution maps, we're seeing that observed and predicted estimates fall much closer to each other. All right, so remember how I mentioned that our study site is split up into three zones? So I created predictive maps of species biomass for all three zones, and total biomass was summed over each area. Highest total biomass for copper rockfish was predicted in the north zone off San Francisco, with over nine tons predicted for this area. But as you work south, the total biomass predicted for copper rockfish decreases. Similarly, green spotted rockfish had highest total biomass in the north zone off San Francisco, and there's a significant drop off in predicted biomass as you work south, with only 291 tons predicted to occur in the southern zone. And more than 47,000 tons of vermilion were predicted in total, with half of this biomass predicted in the small southern region between Lopez Point and Cape San Martin. Discussion. All right, so how useful are the models and maps of predicted density? The models do an all right job. The remotely sensed habitat features explain a fair amount of deviance. However, generally, low R-square values indicate poor fit and that little variation in densities is actually explained. Map results can be driven by one or two predictors. For example, the copper rockfish predictive model was driven by the relationship with depth. 
And we know there are more factors which affect copper rockfish distribution patterns, but the predictive map only reflected the relationship with depth. So when we, and when we look at the map, we're seeing high predicted values for copper. Yeah, it's shallow, but this is also sandy area where we know copper rockfish don't occur. <clears throat> and we saw that while there was a positive linear relationship between observed and predicted densities, the models generally predicted densities higher than what were observed the following year. So the bulk of observed values fell within 10 to 20 percent of predicted values. These are locations where no fish are seen, but the model is predicting fish to occur. However, when fish did occur, the model often underpredicted densities. So if we look at a snippet of the data, we can see this. Overall, the <coughs> model is overpredicting densities. But many times when we see fish, those are the areas highlighted purple, the model is predicting densities lower than what, are, what we're seeing. However, most of the time we don't see fish. So in the instances where fish are not seen, the model is predicting density values greater than zero. So they might be over predicting by a small bit, but it's adding up. So, and these models are not predicting peaks in density and they're also smoothing out the troughs. So in conclusion, these predictive maps can be very helpful in looking at broader distribution patterns and in determining where we should see fish and the relative spatial abundances in which they should occur. However, we should regard density estimates with some speculation. All right, so why are we seeing differences in densities predicted one year and those observed the next? So one possible reason is that the 2013 model, or one possible reason that the 2013 model overpredicted 2014 densities could be that fish populations actually declined in this time. However, there's no other reports of this happening, um, so that's highly unlikely. Another possible explanation is that there are small scale temporal changes in spatial distributions. Matthews, 1986, found that copper rockfish densi densities fluctuated significantly between seasons. However, we sample during all seasons and during all times of day even, so we shouldn't have missed fish in 2014 that we saw in 2013 because of this variation. And lastly, it might be as simple as the model has poor predictive power. Um, the model is assigning predicted values based on habitat and species relationships with habitat. So let's say a fish is found in high densities on rock habitat, and so rock habitat is all given high predicted density values. But we know fish are not distributed homogeneously over rock habitat, and all, not all rock is created equal. And that there could be other factors such as oceanographic variation which can make one rock outcrop more favorable than the next. All right, so why are we seeing differences in biomass estimates with changes in map resolutions? So one of the possible reasons is that the value each cell is assigned is inherently affected by cell size. So let's say the area here shaded in yellow is rock habitat. So we can see that the amount of area designated as rock habitat can change based on cell size. And I saw that in my study, right? I saw that when we used the one meter map, less area was designated as rock habitat than on either the five meter or 10 meter resolution maps. So differences in habitat coverage can cause differences in predictive biomass. So this can affect our estimates. Um, additionally, artifacts can also affect estimates. So this is the VRM layer at the one meter resolution. And all along the map, you can see this fine vertical striping, these little stripes. And that striping is artificial. So artifacts are often caused by the boat rocking back and forth during the mapping process, and they're hard to avoid. But the program picks up that variation and thinks it's real seafloor variation. And so you can see um, these areas are getting high VRM value. And there's thinking there's structure there where there's not actually. And lastly, we saw that the model is over predicting what we're actually seeing. All right, so maps of higher resolution are made up of more cells. Now this extrapolation of overprediction over more cells could be another reason why we're seeing such high estimates using the one meter resolution map. All right, so the last stock assessment of vermilion was done in 2005, and, es and they estimated abundances of vermilion rockfish to be between 2,500 and 5,400 tons in, southern, in northern California, excuse me, and between 2,200 and 12,200 tons in southern California. Now, I didn't create predictive maps for northern or southern California, but in comparison, the models I used predicted over 47,000 tons in central California. <laughs> so, 
These predictions are not over the same area, but the difference in my model estimates and stock assessment estimates is quite large and not likely due to real differences in populations. So these models that I used were made with 10 meter resolution bathymetry, which were shown to have predicted biomass estimates that were similar to observed biomass estimates. So why is there such a large discrepancy? Well, this could be caused by the extrapolation of small over predictions that I was just talking to you guys about. So while predicted biomass estimates are similar to observed over a smaller mapped area, when mapped over a larger area, over predictions can be, are applied to many more cells, and so this effect is compounded. All right, so in conclusion, species distribution modeling is the future. Um, it is. Remotely sensed habitat variables as a group describe a considerable amount of variation in species densities and models derived from these relationships do a fair job of predicting density distributions. However, models over-predict over densities at a high frequency. And biomass estimates can vary greatly with small changes in map resolution. So in conclusion, predictive models and maps do a good job of predicting relative abundances of fishes, but we need to be careful when using predicted estimates of density and biomass. So a lot of people to acknowledge. Um, this thesis is the result of the combined effort of many people. Um, first off, I want to thank my advisor, Rick Starr, uh, for the continued guidance and support throughout my long graduate career. Um, also, the experience I've gained through being in your lab, as well as working on several projects such as CCFRP and the Video Lander project has been invaluable to me. So I really appreciate you sticking this through with me. Um, I also want to thank the rest of my thesis committee, who have also helped me so much, and I'm so fortunate to have been able to learn from you guys and this whole community in general. Um, choo, choo, choo. You guys are all amazing scientists, and I look up to each one of you a lot. Um, OK, so the collection of fish observation data in this thesis was the result also of a lot of hard work from a lot of people collaboration with the Nature Conservancy, especially efforts of Mary Gleason and Steve Reinecke, um, were crucial to making this happen. Um, the folks at NIMPS were also pivotal in this project, so I want to shout out John Field, Becky Miller, and Amber Payne. Um, also, Dirk Rosen and Rick Botman are the engineers who built the video lander. We're always there making sure everything ran smoothly. The Marisage family was crucial in the data collection process. Um, we used their both the Donna Kathleen, what else? Well, it's Donna Klein, I want to thank Donna um, for your huge role in this project and continued support throughout my graduate career. Oh, there's Donna. I got you. <laughs> um, Donna Klein, as well as Christian Denny and Brian Downey were also essential in the data collection and video analysis of hundreds of hours of video. I want to thank Karina, Marks, and Ryan Fields for their continued assistance throughout this whole thing, particularly with GIS and data analyses. Um, Ryan was there to help me through data analyses when I was about to pull my hair out, so thank you for all your help. Um, also Tara, who has been beyond helpful in uh, getting, getting me through this alive. Um, who else? Oh, I also wanted to acknowledge my bathymetric data sources. I use bathymetric data collected, processed, and distributed by Ambari, California State University, Seafloor Mapping Lab, as well as NOAA. And I also, last but not least, want to thank all of my lab mates, oh, here we go, past and present in the fisheries, conservation, fisheries and conservation biology lab for their camaraderie and support throughout this entire process. You guys have been awesome and very honored to be defending the same day as Jen. And I also want to thank everyone in the IC lab as well as all my friends and family. I couldn't have done this by myself and I want to thank all of you guys. Thank you. No questions. <laughs> and with that, I'll take any questions. Yes. Um, I was curious about, you know, trying to talk about the future of this. I'm assuming that um, like the night data was not possible. Correct. We didn't, well, not to say it's not possible, because there's lights and everything on the video lander, but correct, we did not collect data at night. And would you expect a difference? You could, right? Because some fish do show um, variation. 
within night and days, whether they're making vertical migrations or whatever. Um, but for the species that we chose, I don't think it would have made a big difference. Maybe for more mobile species, um, yeah. like larger home ranges. Bobby. So when you graph your observed versus predicted uh, fish abundances mm -hmm. for biomass, it, that's a, yeah. Yeah, that's a, it showed that there was really a lot more um, predicted. Are there any factors to your model that you think you could have added that would have made it a bit of a stronger model? Yeah, of course, right? So the only um, predictors that were, or the predictors that were used in the model were all benthic variation. Um, so there's oceanographic characteristics, which definitely influence fish distributions, which were not included in the model. I didn't have that data on a fine scale, enough to be able to use them as predictors, but yeah, definitely. Mary? I was just wondering if you would uh, suggest that governments invest in benthic habitat mapping and at what resolution oh, for, fishery uh, uh, for fisheries <laughs> management. Okay. Um, yeah, I would. Like I said, I used, we still have to be careful about estimates, but the predictive mapping is still really useful in determining where we see fish. And, you know, like any tool, any new tool, there still needs to be development, I'm sure, on it to get these models maybe where they need to be. Um, but yeah, I would recommend the use of this tool because we, it can help us find fish. And um, there's a second part of that question. At what scale? What oh, what resolution? Okay. So that's more difficult. I guess right now I would say the 10 meter resolution. We found the lowest estimates that were closest to our observed estimates using that resolution. Um, but then I saw also when I did use maps of 10 meter resolution, we still saw this over prediction. So um, it's difficult. But yeah, I would recommend at this point 10 meter. Anybody else? Why did you just use the head of the Kamari Canyon as the element in one of your parameters? Why Carmel, didn't I? Yeah, no, Carmel Canyon or something. Like what about all the other canyons? Why did you just use this for Kamari Canyon? Like, oh, 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 why did I? Yeah, just yeah um, it was just. I'm just adding in uh, different variables that I thought potentially could be important. Not to say that there was much, there's much data on it, but there's the um, possibility using this to kind of keep creating different variables after you collect your data. So based on that, I thought, why not add these things? <laughs> Any other questions? So, <laughs> so um, you, uh, this is further probing into uh, trying to figure out how, what you would suggest to make these models uh, appear closer to uh, the observed models. Or do you think the observed uh, estimates are all wrong? Um, well, I mean, they're what we observed, so. But, um, okay, so remember I said artifacts was a big thing. So definitely be aware of the data quality of the maps that you're using. Um, the greater amount of artifacts might, are going to affect your estimates more. So looking at that um, would be really important, but. Well, how would you improve your models? You could add in more, more variables as well if you have this oceanographic data on a fine enough scale to use it for the mapping. Could add that as well, that would improve the models. And my last question would be, um, those models are all based upon X, Y, Z variables. And uh, in the terrestrial environment, uh, people are very interested and have um, developed uh, algorithms based upon uh, Habitat patches that are landscape variables rather than necessarily XYZ variables, um, such as a, a photo meadow, or mm -hmm. you know, if you think of it as a reef. Mm -hmm. And um, do you think you could incorporate those landscape variables into the models? Yeah, yeah, and I actually tried to do that. Um, I had some difficulty with delineating 
different habitat patches and things like that, of landscape variables, but it's definitely possible. Um, and again, relies on the quality of your map and things like that. But yes, these maps are being used to distinguish um, between different like substrate types and things like that. So, or habitat patches. What's up? Mm -hmm. in California, was there anything you were able to compare with uh, for your predicted numbers in California? No. No, I didn't see any. Or else I would have. Yeah. I would. <laughs> okay. All right, is that it? Okay. All right. take her away into the secret room. Um, but I, first of all, I want to uh, thank the FCB lab and the ICH lab uh, for uh, providing the, um, the desserts and the, and the drinks Me for too. this afternoon. Thank you. So have at it. Okay.